Well, this is family, and I want to say how pleased I am to be with old friends, looking again at a period and a group of people who have this day even more intense interest to us than they might have 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I have two themes, really. Only one, uh, one is that it was a, a great moment when a new nation was established in this continent dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I want to explore the nature of that moment with you. And the second is that the earth is the book of our lives upon which we write indelibly whatever we may say in our archives, in our filing cabinets, and in our libraries. It is the earth that bears the consequences of our actions. The earth, particularly this earth, out these windows, bears the consequences of a series of political decisions made between 1780 and 1820, and even earlier at that initial moment. <laughs> Not because I thought we should be, in Mr. Jefferson's term, be dollared. <coughs> he feared we would become be dollared, infatuated with dollars, getting dollars, but because our dollar carries upon it uh, a sense of that extraordinary founding moment. It says under the pyramid, on the other side from the founding father, novus ordo seclorum, not terribly good Latin, but wonderful politics. This is a new thing we are doing, both in space, because seclorum means geography, but in time as well. They had a sense that they were making a new beginning. They had a powerful sense, as Jefferson said, that they were opening a new page. Or as Timothy Pickering, enormously important figure, proclaimed it, they had a sense that anything was possible. I think it was. Almost anything was possible. After all, um, half the states of the Union emerged from an eight-year civil war, our first great civil war, having abolished slavery or put it on the way to abolition. After all, the great act of patricide in which the revolting founding fathers decapitated the social system and rid themselves of the symbols of continuity, the patriarchate, the clergy, the established clergy, gone, most of the judges gone, most of the senior lawyers gone, all the senior bureaucrats gone, the army defeated. Eight years of civil war produced an opening for a new generation. Let's look at the circumstances of the founding moment, because we tend sometimes to think that they were the only founding fathers. The new order in the universe was not a new order, but come, was coming at the end of an old order for others. There is a second American Declaration of Independence issued in July of 1785. Alexander McGilvery was its draftsman, and it goes like this. This is the Declaration of Tallahassee. We chiefs and warriors do hereby in the most solemn manner protest against any title, claim, or demand the American Congress may set up for or against our lands, settlements, and hunting grounds in consequence of said treaty of peace between the King of Great Britain and the United States of America. This assemblage of largely Creeks, Cherokees, and Chickasaws gathered to say further that the treaty-making, we tend to pay a lot of attention to what the Europeans said they were doing, that the treaty-making, the lines in question, mean nothing to us, for we were not parties to these divisions and assignments. His Britannic Majesty, 
was never possessed by cession or purchase or by right of conquest of the territories. The said treaty gives away their land. But here, I think, and it goes on a bit to demonstrate that there were a large group of people, the majority, actually, of the people living in the continent, who were not consulted in the Treaty of Paris. But it goes on at the end to say, we are a free people and mean to continue so. The persons present in the continent, so wonderfully memorialized in the opening chamber of Monticello, the persons present included those who were very clear that whatever the Europeans might draw on maps, they had other views of things. Let's look at the other participants just, just for a moment. The Spanish Empire holds the western two-thirds of the continent at the end of, of our Civil War, First Civil War. Spanish Empire has exerted itself for a final spasm of intense military competence and activity. They are participating in the other great siege, Yorktown's one, Pensacola, of course, is the other, and the third, in which the Spanish Empire, with some assistance from its Indian allies and George Rogers Clark, stood off the British and the Sioux, as you all know, at St. Louis. Yorktown, St. Louis, Pensacola is the great triangle of revolutionary war activity involving the other nations. The Spanish Empire had exhausted itself in the New World with that action. The French, having relinquished the Mississippi Valley in 1762-3, found ways to extort it back again, as we all know at the time of the Louisiana Purchase, to extort it back from Spain on the explicit treaty obligation that they could divest it to any other group except the United States. <coughs> Politically, then, the occupants of a vast territory are confronted with an enormously energetic group of people bent upon founding a new nation with a set of ideals within it. One of those founders expressed one of those ideals in language that is familiar to all of us. But let me put his statement about the desired kind of culture and society that he hoped to establish in the context of the other three objectives of the victory of 1783. They were, of course, independence from the, Brit from the British Empire politically. Second independence of the thraldom of British mercantile policy. Just as important, said explicitly so to Hamilton, to Jefferson, Madison, and Franklin, escape from the hegemony of British economic policy. And third, for many Americans, uh, the freedom of all. Mr. Jefferson stated his social ideal to Albert Gallatin in 1807, when the question became, what are you going to do with not just what you already have in the United States, but what are you going to do, you shoot me that clock and I will keep an eye on things here, thank you. Um, you'll be relieved to know there is one. Um, what are we going to do not only with what we've got, but what we just got in, in, in Louisiana? To Jefferson to Gallatin, how much better to have every 160 acres settled by an able-bodied militiaman than by, purchases, than by purchasers with their hordes of Negroes to add weakness instead of strength. Jefferson declared himself in 1807 once again as averse to a system of plantation slavery and hoping that we could establish with each step of the way west a society of free and independent family farmers. It's my contention for the next 10 minutes that that was a possibility. That if politics is the art of the possible, then the history of politics is the history of what might have been possible. Let's look at the condition of things at the time that the Louisiana Purchase doubled 
the size of territory claimed by persons of European descent. The same thing, not the same thing as doubling the territory of the United States, claimed by persons of European descent. Uh, and of course the other third was the second bite at the Spanish Empire, then Mexico by succession 40 years later. What was the state of things when we came out of our, of our Civil War? No one in Virginia, no one in Virginia that I know of proclaimed a positive good theory about slavery. Nobody could be found who explicitly said, nobody of any leadership recognition, to say that slavery was a good thing. Many people acted upon the presumption that it was a bad thing and freed their slaves. John Randolph, George Wythe, famously George Washington, but it strikes me that George Washington is more interesting for another thing that he did along the same lines. For if the objective was to establish a culture in which free, independent family farmers would prevail, then Washington's reference to that ideal as a culture of real farmers, real farmers, seems to me to be very important in the context, which was that he offered up Mount Vernon estate to anyone who would buy it and divide it into family farms that would be farmed by real farmers, not by people driving slaves. Washington not only freed his own, but he offered his home farm as a place for that, shall we say, social experiment. There was abroad in Virginia and North Carolina a profound willingness on the part of many people to follow the lead of the other half of the states that had won in the Civil War, the first Civil War, that which completed itself in 1783. The governor of Virginia, Governor Wright, was the president of the Abolition Society and remained on the Council of Virginia until the 1820s, was not thrown out of the place. As you know, it was two great men, Edward Coles and Thomas Worthington, went north to become respectively governors of Ohio and Illinois, having freed their slaves. And at the time that we encountered what I believe to be one of the genuinely tragic moments in Thomas Jefferson's life, there was, which is the actions of 1784-85, the last time he really tried to do something adverse to slavery, This is a tr when we come to this point, things were very, very shaky for the institution of slavery. And, and I, I want to pursue this subject as we go west a little bit. You all recall the occasion in which Timothy Pickering proposed that for the west, except for Kentucky, it should all be without slavery by 1800. Timothy Pickering proposed it. Jefferson seconded the motion. It lost, as you recall, as Jefferson said, by one individual, by an individual vote only. The fate of millions unborn, he wrote, hung on the tongue of one man, and heaven was silent in that awful moment. Heaven was indeed silent at that awful moment. Jefferson went off to Paris. James Monroe took his place on the appropriate committee. And when the resolution came up again, it was without the Pickering-Jefferson provision. As Henry Ammon has said, it is strange that neither Monroe nor Jefferson ever commented on the omission. The fate indeed, of millions, hung on the actions of a single man. Kentucky was the exception, though. Let's look at Kentucky for just a moment. Between 1792 and 1798, there were three Kentucky conventions, and throughout them all, the politics of conscience was still vigorous in Kentucky. David Rice, the founder of Presbyterianism in Kentucky, and the five leaders of the Baptist and Methodist churches all were arrayed as a block against slavery. 
And they nearly won. They nearly won. In fact, they got so close that by the time that the Nicholases prevailed at the end of the 90s, that block had seen to it that a provision permitting all white, oh, sorry, all males to vote had to be explicitly removed from the Kentucky Constitution in the final of the three conventions. We must not assume anything like a solid South. George Washington was the founder of the new South. He really meant it when he sought real farmers. In Kentucky, it almost, almost stopped. It's frequently forgotten, I think, that in the lower house of the Mississippi legislature, the year before the Louisiana Purchase, the lower house passed an anti-slavery resolution in Mississippi territory. The senior house refused to hear of it. It is often, I think, overlooked that when, when Louisiana was purchased, the situation in, in the Louisiana territory as purchased was so fluid, so susceptible to the termination of slavery, that only one slave ship had appeared in the last 40 years in the harbor of New Orleans, only one. The Spanish and French governors were so hostile to the plantation system that they had managed in Isaiah Berlin's terms to wither it up into the cities. It was not, plantation slavery was not prospering in Louisiana any more than it was on Haiti. And then another moment arises in which James Monroe is present again and the fate of millions yet unborn hung on the tongue of a single man. For when the Louisiana Purchase negotiations were fully underway in Paris in 1802, James Monroe was sent packing from the focus, as Secretary of State Madison put it, with new instructions. At the very last minute, at the very last minute, Fulwer Skipwith carried a message. And I do not know what was in it, but I do know that for the first time in the very last draft of the purchase agreements, language was inserted assuring, in effect, that slave owners could continue to own their slaves and could continue to import, or so the language was interpreted in every congressional debate thereafter. In my view, the great constitutional debate in American history is that of over the Hill House Amendments in 1856. The purchase has occurred. The French have held Louisiana for the twinkling of an eye having removed it illegally from Spain, having illegally refused to give it to somebody else but not the Americans under, contract, under, under treaty arrangements, and it has been purchased. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Slavery is drying up. There is plenty of anti-slavery settlement in the South and the West. And the Congress, having rejected George Thatcher's resolution to keep slavery out of Mississippi, barely, Barely. Assembles again, and there is a lengthy two-year debate in which everybody stands up and is counted on the question as to whether or not there should be, indeed, a, a society of able-bodied militiamen rather than purchasers and hordes of Negroes, etc. <laughs> the extraordinary thing to me is that the, that the proponents of a prohibition either upon slave trade or upon slavery itself one, during the course of that process in what one great historian has described as the greatest single step toward freedom in American history between the revolution itself and 1865. But the fate of millions did hang on the tongue of a single man. And in those debates, ultimately, that language in the treaty prevailed, but not until Jesse Franklin of North Carolina, a man who deserves a first-class biography, stood up finally. He'd been a Revolutionary War hero. Uh, he, uh, he was on his way to being governor. And when the South Carolinians said that uh, they would, said again that they would secede if 
their expansion and sale, expansion of the plantation system and the sale of slaves was denied them. Jesse Franklin came down from the hill, so to speak, and said, it would not bother me if we sent gunboats into the harbor of Charleston to fritter those slave traders out of there. North Carolina was a vigorous opponent to the expansion of slavery. No, upcountry North Carolina was late, much later than that. But in those debates, once again, the margin was narrowly won. I should say that the fate of millions was once again adversely affected. It's a useful thing for us today, afflicted as we are with a sense of inevitability, with a sense that we are powerless in the presence of great forces that outstrip us. To note how often in the course of our nation's history, just another voice, just another voter, just another someone present might have made it different. Arkansas came into the Union as a slave territory and a slave state by the narrowest of margins, 52-48. Missouri the same. We tend to think of those states as being implacably slave states, as we do Mississippi and, and Virginia. They were not. The Maryland delegation and the <coughs> Delaware delegations, both slave states, were, were split during the Hill House debates. Now, in a sense, so what? Well, that is to say, is this all politics? It's terrible politics in that by the time that Mr. Jefferson, in despair, I believe, said that his only consolation was that he would not live to see the final destruction of the great experiment which they had commenced in 1776 and 1783, when in the course of the Missouri debate, he spoke of the fire bell that rings in the night. The fire bell had rung over many nights. That's our tragedy, isn't it? It was just not enough within the energies of the resistors to be successful in tipping it just the other way. Chiefs and warriors did their best. Slaves did their best to escape often into the welcoming arms of some chiefs and warriors. Maroon colonies are people who acted upon their determination against slavery. Texas was a great sump of black people seeking freedom. There were only seven or eight slaves in San Antonio, for example, in 1820. It was a place full, uh, with many more free blacks than slave blacks. Behind Louisiana was f essentially free territory. And Louisiana could have gone any other way. I said, so what? I didn't mean to demean the importance of political history. But I do want to tell you that if you have been director of the National Park Service, you encounter many biologists. They tend to, to tell you, if you're a sort of a political historian type, that your vision of the world is very, very narrow, very spavent. Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, is prone to go for walks with people like us and uh, reach his hand down into the dirt and pick it up and say, there is the universe. How many species? A thousand? 2,000, how many species are there in that handful of dirt? <laughs> and the consequences to the earth are what matter. We will come and go. I looked at Mr. Jefferson's portrait uh, with gratitude today when he was my age, 77, 78. <laughs> but the map and the portrait to which I wish to call your attention now is out those windows. It's out those windows. Every one of these decisions had an effect upon the land because the fact of the matter is that 
free and independent yeomen or family farmers just because they are so poor they can't buy the next place? Let's assume they are no more virtuous. Let us drop all virtue of independent yeomanry out the window. Family farmers keep their own cattle and their own cattle manure their ground. Per acre there are there's more dung to manure the fields with a family farmer than there is with a very large plantation owner. It works that way. That's the first thing. You, you can't keep moving on. The average southern planter, at least in Alabama and Georgia, so far as I can determine by trying to look at the numbers, moved on average twice in their lifetime between 1810 and 1840. There was a migratory pattern moving westward, driving your slaves ahead of you or bringing your slaves behind you. But the migratory pattern was that you never stayed long enough to manure the place. As Jefferson himself said, it is cheaper for us to buy a new acre than to manure an old one. Washington was tougher than that. He simply said, we have worked our lands to death. And from the Chesapeake southward, the, uh, the desolating army of slaves being driven, why should they care for the land? Overseers. Why should they care for the land? Their job was to move on to the next land to exploit. The process of destroying this very, very shallow southern earth proceeded from political decision to political decision, from one new area to another new area, until they reached that enormously rich bank, essentially, of uh, dirt dunes, dust dunes, the lowest hills above Natchez, and they desolated that, though it's 300 feet deep by the time that the plantation system finished with it. Mississippi our, uh, agricultural historians tell us it was, it, they, they, by the time that they had sickened it, in Ed Wilson's terms, it would no longer support a cotton crop or any other crop. And you can go to the places most densely occupied by chiefs and warriors of sedentary Indian tribes, and they are sick today, sickened by the plantation system. Let me make this graphic for you. No slides. I just want to ask you to imagine three maps. The first is where there was the deepest concentration of chiefs and warriors, of tribes, of people practicing agriculture in 1783. Not hard to find. Good maps. Cherokee, the, the Cherokees in the bend of the, of the Tennessee River, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, and the Creeks were farming what later became the Cotton Belt. If you look at where those tribes were still left after the treaties up to about 1810, they were in occupancy of an area that is precisely that occupied most densely by the plantation system in 1860. These two maps overlay each other with great precision. And there's a third. Uh, there they happen. Those two maps can be conveniently found in Mr. Jefferson's Lost Cause. But what you can't find in Mr. Jefferson's Lost Cause, because I was too dumb to look for it, are the poverty maps of the, of the 2000 and of the year 2000 census. If you look at those counties across the South in which poverty is deepest in the year 2000 and you can be sure in the year 2003, they are almost precisely congruent with the preceding two maps. They are first of all where the land was richest most susceptible to the gentle, relatively gentle, not sweet, but relatively gentle treatment of Native American agriculture, where the plantation system landed hardest. And if you look today, that is absolutely where you will find the deepest poverty. The Delta region just east of the Mississippi, enormously rich in 1800, enormously poor today. The Black Belts, overlying the Selma chalk of Mississippi and Alabama. Any of you who come from there know how hard it is to get a crop out of the ground. Where, where, little Tallahassee, where this statement of the chiefs and warriors was issued, 
places where William Bartram came and found field after open field where the, where the Indians had farmed successfully for millennia. If you look at the sites of the great mound centers of the Mississippian period, that's exactly where the plantation system landed most desperately and where poverty is deepest today because the land was sickened. The land was sickened by political decisions permitting a way of farming to persist, to be imposed upon the land, and that is the deepest tragedy because what we write upon the land is indelible. What we write by our political actions today is indelible. What we do to the air, clean air, just a little dirtier, just marginally dirtier, the water just a little dirtier, the organic food standards just a little weaker, the number of snowmobiles in Yellowstone just a few more, just a little, not a lot. Does it matter? Did it matter when the single tongue was silent in 84? When the balance was struck in Kentucky in 92, 96, and 98, in Mississippi in 18, 2, in the Hill House debates in 18, 5, and 6, in Arkansas, in Missouri, it mattered, not just to the humans, not just to the slaves, not just to the Indians, but to every subsequent generation of potential inhabitants of a sickened South. So, every morning when we get up, we confront a novus ordus seclorum. Every morning, every morning when the director of the park service or the director of any park or any of us or the chief of the Environmental Protection Agency, every morning, it's a new order in the universe for that person. Every morning that it's election day and it's too much trouble, it's a new order in the universe. In this generation, it is my belief we are confronted with the deepest human crisis, deepest human crisis, since when? Since the Little Ice Age. Because we are afflicting the earth in ways of which we are as unconscious as the generation of Thomas Jefferson was unconscious of the consequences to the southern earth. As one drives here from Chapel Hill, which we did yesterday, we are driving through a landscape which with one or two degrees of increased average heat will be a tinderbox. If you think that it's just the West whose skies will be yellow and whose horizons will be red with flame, you only have to look at that landscape and imagine it drier and hotter. This is a landscape upon which we have written a bitter story. It's a landscape in which we can now write a better story. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you, you entertain questions? Oh, sure. Or comments or speeches or whatever we need to do. <laughs> He's got more tape. We can, he, me. Are you all done? Are you are happy? Sure. Anybody want to make a speech or make a comment or ask a question? Bell yourselves at the microphone there. Or don't if you want to bellow. This is this ghastly hi, Dan. Thank you. That's a, it's kind of you to do this. Uh, you make a case, Roger, that uh, anti-slavery had a chance in the early 1800s, but uh, virtually all of your examples are from the Piedmont or West, and I think a, a majority of the people live within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. That's where most of the slaves were in the South. Uh, I mean, what's your case that anti-slavery had a chance where the slaves actually were? Like Dutchess County, New York? 
Well, in the south. Uh, I, but you said, I know, but, but I'm just, I'm, I know you said South, but I'm just wanting you to broaden this up just a little bit. There were more slaves per capita in Dutchess than there were in North Carolina. There were more slaves in the city of New York than there were in the city of Charleston. There were more slaves, in fact, there were slaves in New Jersey till 1858 uh, because the people didn't die as quickly as they might have. Um, I think the possibility, uh, goodness, it doesn't matter what I think. Um, New Jersey and New York, the great slave selling and slave holding state of Rhode Island managed to abolish slavery. Uh, I think we're... Um, I apologize. I thought your focus was on the, the sick and south. And it was. The question is, uh, what about the sick and south? Slavery prospects where the slaves actually were concentrated. Oh, oh it, much harder. It's only where you keep them out. If you keep the system out, you have a better chance of stopping it. That's why 84, 92, 96, 82 are significant. Do I think it could be abolished here? I don't know. I don't have to know that. All I have to know is that the argument was about extending it. The argument from the beginning was about expanding it. I don't, um, I beg your pardon. I did not respond to your initial question. What could have been done about slaves where they most densely were? I don't know the answer to that. All I know is that stopping the movement westward was possible, in my view, repeatedly, and wasn't, and it wasn't done. Um, I don't, I don't think it is, I don't think it is morally required of us to visit upon the people of the past a sense of, of what they should have done to struggle harder to do an, a second revolution or a simultaneous revolution. I just think one tries to deal with decisions on margin. What happens where there's a tipping point? That's all. That's all politics is, is what's possible on the edge. Is that a better answer than the first answer? <laughs> it's too hard. It's too hard. I, I, I have very little patience for people who, who think we could all have done, made it easily. It wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't easy for the slaves who did it themselves. Uh, any other comments? You see, he's tried very hard to prime this pump, and I'm grateful to him for doing so. Your alternative to that is just to sit there and, and uh, wonder about your own preconceptions. L let me go back, if I may, to this fundamental, I think, moral question. What's the relationship between a preference to let market forces determine outcomes and a determination to recognize the existence of market forces and recognize them to be human artifacts. That is, they're the consequences of human arrangements. It can easily be argued that the pressure of British economic policy, which we don't have time to discuss, was so great that they were so clever in re-enthralling the South that it was impossible to prevent the expansion. And I will settle for accepting that argument after about 1820. But between 1778 and 1820, I will contend that there was an opportunity to stop slavery in its tracks. And that, of course, is what the Lincoln-Douglas debate was about, <laughs> really. Was it possible to stop it? Yes, sir. May, excuse me, uh, no, but, you, but you're doing fine. Jan, Jan is a oh, wise and patient woman. <laughs> yes, sir. No, no, but you can go first because oh, she is I, such a wise I, and patient I woman. Jan. Okay. Hi, Jan. Well, hi. Well, maybe I'm following up on, on Dan's question. Maybe I'm following up on your response. Uh, how do you read the three fifths compromise? <clears throat> how? Oh. 
It's the kind of thing that happens late at night. It seemed, it seemed like such a clever way of balancing property rights and franchise rights. And it's, it's the kind of thing which, when you're exhausted in a legislative chamber, and there's something kind of neat about it that you can go for without thinking about it. And that's especially true if you are trying to keep together a very fragile artifact. It's very easy for us to forget how really fragile it was. And you think, and you take Pierce Butler seriously. You think he really will take South Carolina out. That's what, of course, they said over and over again. Ha, huh, who is so smart as to know that he wouldn't have? Who is so smart to know that if he tried, they wouldn't have gone? Who is so smart to know that it was essentially a bluff to be called? It's so easy in retrospect. But having been present on a couple of occasions in which a cabinet secretary rises to the cleverness of a gadget, I fear desperately that there is an element of a cleverness here that settled in. Is that okay? Dan, what were you going to say? Comment on the abolition of the foreign slave trade in Jefferson's second administration, uh, especially as it relates to some of the arguments in your book. Well, he acquiesced in, in, the, in the 188 um, action in which unless they kept it, it was going to go. Um, of course, uh, it's, it's mean-spirited, but true to say that, mm -hmm. that by that time, slaves were capital, and, and having slaves that were free from competition from imports was um, a good thing if you were a slave owner. There was another argument freely made at the time, which was that African slaves came bearing new diseases which would contaminate the existing stock. And therefore, it was a bad idea to, to uh, import disease-bearing persons that might diminish your capital stock by sickening your, your assets. Um, it's a pretty grim calculus that people are making. I do not think it was a heroic action to permit the Congress not to extend it. I do think that the... Um, The distinction that was of such immense importance to Jefferson himself in the writing of the Declaration between the King of, of England's participation in the slave trade, as he contended, and the actual existence of slavery itself is a very, very important distinction that we have to keep judging. Um, in the Hill House debates, there's a good deal of discussion about this question of the difference between somebody who owns a slave and wants its value to rise, its scarcity of value to rise, and the value of somebody who doesn't have enough and wants to import them from somewhere else. But is this just not loathsome to be talking this way? Isn't this a terrible thing to be discussing what happens to human beings in this way that we must? This is, the, this is the legacy that we live with. It's unavoidable, but terrible, terrible. I don't know any of you have ever seen a slave as a slave. I have, and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a good thing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's rather like, it's rather like the, the, the smell of death on a battlefield. It's not a pleasant thing. You don't, Jan Lewis and I are talking about military, um, actions in the 18th century. You can't just talk about military actions in the 18th century once you have seen somebody dead from, on a battlefield. It's very unpleasant. Same thing for slavery. Can we, let's do something cheerier, like play the violin or something at this juncture, or with somebody, yes, sir? Well, I have something perhaps cheerier. I can't begin to compete with the three historians. You have made comments and the two questioners. Um, so I'll ask maybe a more general or philosophical question. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, you've painted a very sobering picture of economics and ecology and politics and perhaps will of the American people uh, today. Um, and I think one of the characteristics beyond historical details, one of the abiding characteristics that many people find in Jefferson's life and work is an inveterate optimism. Yes. 
And so I'm hoping for some salvation here. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this Jeffersonian optimism and faith um, in the future and in the wisdom of the American people will prevail? You bet and where I do. do you see that in economics, ecology, and political politics? I wouldn't be standing here beating myself up on the road on this subject if I didn't. Why bother? I believe that we are on the brink, I thought we were two years ago, on the brink of a reversion to the spirit of the early 1790s, the 1840s, the 1860s, the uh, progressive era, and the New Deal period. I, I believe it's still. I think we've been a little deferred by some military adventures, but I think I believe it's coming back because we are, in a, we are a nation that has cyclical periods of intense selfishness intense inward looking and uh, and a kind of imperial expression that is bullying internally and externally but we survive that and we we come back and we pull ourselves together as a nation to embark upon large large endeavors together generally speaking we need some kind of terrible crisis like a civil war either one of the first two civil wars the 70, 70, 60, 83 one and the 70, 61 to 65 one, or a Great Depression. But by golly, I believe we are capable of pulling ourselves up by our socks. I think young people are capable of voting. I think it's possible for older people to be exciting, to, to generate interest and enthusiasm, to find a metaphor, to write the lead. It is not necessary for good people to be boring. It is only necessary for there to be a sufficient sense of outrage in the presence of evil to recognize it as evil and say so.